Welcome to Love for the Truth Radio, a program devoted to encouraging you to be a contender of the faith in an ever-changing church culture. On Love for the Truth Radio, we will discuss current issues and challenging views along with biblical truth that can affect our Christian worldview and how we live out our faith. And now, here's your host, Cindy Hartline. Welcome to the program. You know, immigration is the hot topic of the hour. Protests are on the rise. But what is the root cause of all this division? And why is Trump's ban on immigrants from particular nations, which are considered to be hotbeds from terrorism, such a touchy subject? Some say if we want a strong economy, we should give immigrants a warm welcome. Others say that immigration could affect families and communities, those torn apart and those who want protection. Protection. Still others believe in order to protect our country and everything that America has stood for, we need to protect our culture from those with different mindsets, values, and morality, different gods. Needless to say, the more opinions, the more confusion. Nations that are primarily Muslim do practice Islam, who consider the Quran, their holy book, to be the verbatim word of God as revealed to the Islamic prophet and messenger Muhammad. In Matthew 24 of the Bible, we read that nations rising against nation is one of the signs of the end times. The word nation in Greek, ethnos, means ethnicity. So ethnic groups will rise against ethnic groups. With various ethnicities come different cultural mindsets that are conformed by the gods they worship. So it seems evident that we indeed are witnessing a spiritual war, Islam versus Christianity, Islam versus Judaism, which is also the root cause of why the land of Israel is continuously being threatened and why current explosive changes in the Middle East are taking place, as well as the rise of the Arab Spring, all of which are significant to what the Bible has prophesied. Our guest, Bill Randalls, is an expert on the subject of Islam from a biblical perspective. Bill penned the book, A Sword in the Land, The Muslim World and Bible Prophecy, which we will be discussing today. Pastor Bill Randalls has founded and served his church ministry, Believers in Grace Fellowship, a non-denominational church in Marion, Iowa, since 1982. He is a Bible teacher, conference speaker, and author of six books. Creation, Fall, and Hope of Redemption, a commentary on Genesis is one of them. Beware the New Prophets Revised, a caution of the prophetic movement, as well as Born from Above, an exposition of John, chapter 3, just to name a few. Again... We will be covering his book, A Sword in the Land, The Muslim World and Bible Prophecy. Pastor Bill and his wife, Kristen, live in Marion, Iowa, along with their six children. Welcome, Bill Randalls. It's a pleasure to have you with us on Love for the Truth Radio. Hey, it's a real honor to be here, Cindy. Thanks. Bill, uh, I want to start off by asking you, can you please share with us what inspired you to write your book, A Sword on the Land, The Muslim World and Bible Prophecy? I'm glad you asked, uh, sister. What, what, what happened is that I've been a lifelong student of the Bible since I was born again in the late 1970s, and I've also been a student of prophecy. And when the events that we call the Arab Spring transpired, um, I saw suddenly, and I know a lot of other people did, that this was not at all what people um, in the secular world were thinking it was going to be, like a new dawning of freedom for the Muslim world. But rather, I could see right away that it was a repositioning of these nations for their position in the end-time prophecies. And I thought I'd give people help by doing this, just one simple thing, and that is taking the ancient names for these nations, mm. updating them to today. Now, some of them you don't have to, like Egypt, they, they have the same name as in the Bible. But once you update the nations like uh, Tyre, Sidon, Lebanon, um, Edom, and so forth, suddenly you see that events that are happening in the Middle East are leaping right off the pages mm. of the biblical prophets. So I wanted to give some explanation for that. That's so interesting, and I have to tell you, I, I read your book, I went through it, it is so extensive, so comprehensive on the on the subject. Thank you so much for, for writing it so that you can oh. open our eyes. You know, I'd like to start, Bill, on, can you please define the religion of Islam for our listeners? Because I'm not sure if they realize that it's the same as yes, the Muslim yes. world, yeah. Yes, definitely. The religion of Islam 
which started in the 6th century AD, is the religion uh, revealed by Muhammad. And they're called Muslims or Islam. Islam means submission. And uh, an interesting thing about the religion of Islam is that though it is though it is a um, sixth century A.D., six centuries after Christ, it is not necessarily specifically predicted in the Bible, but the way I put it is it's very specifically anticipated mm. in the Bible. And I think this is a very important point to understand. Um, the, the, the stories in Genesis of Esau and Jacob and Ishmael and Isaac that is the way to understand what's happened here. Okay, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you have um, Jake, uh, Abraham is the father of our faith. Okay, well the Muslims call him the father of their faith. Abraham had a surrogate son named Ishmael, and Abraham had a miracle baby named Isaac. The Bible says that the Messiah was going to come to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, I, Isaac was was a miracle baby. He but thirteen years before Abraham had Ishmael. Now, this caused resentment to Hagar and Ishmael. And then in the next generation, uh, Jacob's had twins. Or Isaac had twins, Jacob and Esau. And Esau was born first. Okay, And in man's reckoning, that's, that, that person is chosen to be the head of the family and to get the double portion of the inheritance and everything. Mm-hmm. But God chose Jacob, not Esau. And, it's, and, and the, the resentment... That uh, of being disenfranchised by Ishmael, Hagar, Esau, um, the the official custodian of that resentment is this religion that formed in the sixth century A.D. Islam. Okay, mm-hmm. and it's almost like a mirror inversion of the Bible. In a few days, there's going to be a feast, Eid, which is uh, the celebration by Muslims of Abraham offering Ishmael as a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Christians and Jews know Abraham offered Isaac. Okay, so what we have is this rival religion, which one out of seven people in the world is Muslim. Mm, that's Islam is massive, okay. The, the largest Muslim nations in the world aren't even Arabic. They are uh, Indonesia and India, number one, number two. Of course, the Middle East, which was originally almost entirely Christianized until the 6th century, when Islam spread like a fire. And Islam has always been, for 1,400 years, a religion of tremendous expansionism, tremendous ambition, and its arrival to the Judeo-Christian world. Mm. Now, uh, a lot of people have short memories, okay, so they don't realize that uh, that, uh, up until 1924, um, they had something called the Caliphate, which was the central authority for Sunni Islam. 80% of all Muslims are Sunni. And it was because of the, their loss in World War One that Turkey um, was on the losing side, and they disbanded the caliphate. And they, we've had about an 80-year period of basically the Muslims kept at bay. Okay, but it wasn't long before that that they were at the gates of Vienna, and they've been a constant expansion and a constant uh, source of, of of what they call jihad. So, so that, that this is a religion that spreads by the sword. Mm. And that's Islam. That's and that Islam. Is, that's Islam. And, and, the, and the ironic thing is, Cindy, okay, in studying Bible prophecies, okay, God says specifically that he's going to go to war with certain nations, many, many nations. I mean, a lot of people in the modern versions of Christianity, they don't realize this aspect of, 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 of the deity. I mean, God is a God of love and peace, but he also says he's going to go to war. And it just so happens that he names the nations that he's going to go to war with in the end times. And the one thing that's constant about every one of them is that they're Muslim nations. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Yeah, it is very interesting, yes. Wow. You know, I, I talked in the beginning, in the intro, uh, about uh, the immigration and all that, and I didn't want to just switch over over the topic here. But what, it's can a good you, subject. Yeah, can you just, just explain to us, like, let's talk about how Muslim nations view Christians and Christianity. Okay. Well, they call it the okay. First of all, let's talk about the the yeah the, how they view Christianity. Then I'd like yeah. to talk about immigration specifically. Okay. Okay. In the Quran, they call the Christians and the Jews the people of the book. Okay. Now the Quran is a dualistic book. Okay. In other words, there's there's two sides to it. 
and those sides do not agree, okay? There's what they call the uh, earlier verses, when Muhammad was out of power, he was a struggling preacher trying to get his new religion off the ground, that he would have these verses in the Quran that were revealed to him that said, make friends with the Jews, make friends with the Christians. They're the people of the book. Listen to them. They can teach you. But those verses are abrogated. There's a doctrine of abrogation that cancels out the peaceful verses. And it says, do not make friends with Christians and Jews. They're your enemies. If you can, destroy them. Okay? Right. So the, so you've got this dissonance that runs right through the Quran and runs right through the heart of every Muslim. Now, Muslim apologists will come forward and quote these peaceful verses, many of them knowing full well that it's the later verses, the mm. abrogated verses, that are the ones that are critical uh, in the mind of Muslims. We're not in a stage where you make friends with Christians and Jews. We're in a stage where you make war on them. Okay. Mm, and then the other thing I think is very important to understand about Islam is that in the, uh, in, Islam started the calendar all over again, in a sense, okay? The year zero, or, or the very first year, is not when Muhammad was born or not when Muhammad received his revelation. The year zero in Islam is the year that Muhammad and his 70 followers were being persecuted in Mecca, and they made an immigration to a city in Arab Arabia called Yathrib, it was originally called Yathrib, and the name was changed to Medina, okay? And there's three Jewish tribes that were primary in that, in that city that made treaties with Muhammad, took him in as immigrants, and welcomed him. Within three years, he had made war on every one of those tribes and wiped out every one of the males and sold the women into slavery. Mm. It's immigration. Is the, that's the year zero, the year of the immigration. That's the model for the expansion of this religion. Okay. People wonder why won't Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, and, and many of these Emirate nations take in all these Syrians if they share the same religion and even the same sect of the religion, which is Sunni. Well, there's two reasons. The Saudis said, well, they, they admitted we're afraid of terrorism from these people. But the second reason is because it's called the hijra, the immigration. Okay. The religion is spread by immigration. So when, when Westerners um, with bleeding hearts and, and true compassion, take these people in, okay? Mm, interesting. Uh, and give them everything. Uh, that is uh, <clears throat> that is uh, that is very very touching to me because uh, that's from their Judeo Christian past, even if they're not even living it. The compassion, the love, yes. the mercy, okay. But Muslims see it a totally different way. They see it as a way to expand their their faith and to spread um, Islam to bring all nations into submission. And by the way, one of the only ways that you can know that you have salvation in, in um, Sunni Islam is either to die in jihad or to go out and become an immigrant and establish Islam in another land. That's interesting. Yeah, it's wow. a very, very serious thing. And uh, one, of the, one of the problems we have in America, okay, is that we have adapted a mindset that just won't consider religion, okay, at all. The, our, lead, our leaders are so secular. Yes. In fact, Obama went so far as to strip out all references to Islam in the CIA and in uh, the FBI and the military intelligence training. There's a, there's a man, a, a Christian brother, uh, who wrote a book on, on it called the See Something, Say Nothing, Philip Haney. Hmm. And he was a high-ranking person in, in the U.S. government in, in intelligence. And all his research on Islam, they said that's against the civil rights of Muslims to tie Islam to terrorism. They stripped all that out, leaving us blinded in the great existential struggle of our time. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back, so please stay tuned. If you're a first-time listener, you'll find that on Love for the Truth Radio, we discuss news and views from a biblical worldview. We believe that the Bible is the inerrant Word of God and the absolute truth that should be applied to every aspect of life. 
We don't proclaim to have a cap on the truth, but we do have a love for biblical truth. So please, take everything you hear on this radio program to study and prayer. And thank you for listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We are back with Pastor Bill Randalls, who penned the book, the Sword on the Land, the Muslim World in Bible Prophecy, which is our topic for today. You know, in witnessing the protests against the immigrant ban from the hotbed for terrorism nations, which are primarily Muslim nations by the Trump administration, we are seeing a real lack of reasonable intelligence in reference to those nations who inevitably believe in the religion of Islam. And Bill, you, you talked about some of what they believe. And you know, the American people... Um, are they exhorting others to accept the immigrants of those nations aware that in doing so we are accepting their religion of Islam by agreeing to live with them as neighbors? You know, I was reading the forward of your book, uh, yeah. and you, you opened up with stating that, that the two evils trouble our times, and they yeah. are the sleeping church and a foolish world. And no doubt that a world without Christ is foolish, but it is evident that the church at large is asleep. So that's what I want to talk and focus about, Bill, because, you know, why aren't we hearing the voice of the church combat that the religion of Islam is, in fact, a lie, which you state in your book? Yes. Well, look, it, 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 part of the problem uh, it, it is even broader, and that is that we have been conditioned uh, very heavily for the last 60 years or so on relativism, okay? Mm -hmm. On the whole idea that any kind of discrimination, any kind of prejudgment is racist, it's, it's, um, it's uh, arrogant, it's, uh, it's chauvinistic, well, you know, Western civilization, okay? And, and this has really affected people within and without the church mm. uh, so badly that they do not, it's, it's not that they're not intelligent, but that they're conditioned into this non-judgmentalism, which is killing us. Yes. Okay, judgments have to be made. People have to take a hard look at Islam. Islam is not a race. Islam is a belief system. It's an ideology. It, the the uh, Constitution says that there must be freedom of religion, but as one Supreme Court justice once famously said, the Constitution is not a suicide pact. Islam is not like any other religion right. that we've ever seen before. It's actually more a political um, ideology than a religion, and the Quran actually primarily does not talk about God or prayer. It talks about how to handle infidels. That's the greatest, biggest wow. subject in the Quran. Did you know that? No, I did how not. How to look at infidels, wow. how to handle them, what to do with them, okay? Um, look, uh, the American people are um, people that believe in the underdog and people that believe in fair play and are very compassionate people. But because of relativism and also because we basically lost our religion, it's been gutted out. Yes. One, one of the things that I've seen over the last 20 years is this, is that you can't fight a false religion with no religion, okay? Exactly. You, you, you really cannot resist something like Islam, which is an aggressive, proselytizing world religion that has ambition to conquest. It cannot be resisted with secularism. It cannot be resisted with atheism. You can't even begin to deal with it, trying to... Uh, apply like um, freedom of religion, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, back when the Europe was mostly Catholic, but they did believe something. Therefore, they, they met force with force and resisted Islam's two great incursions, especially uh, very fiercely, and, and pushed them back. And I thank God for it, okay? Mm -hmm. But what, we're, what we are is we're a relativized nation, that we're a politicized nation, Yes. And there, there are forces on the left that want to tear this country apart, and they are against everything about mm -hmm. our civilization that is Judeo-Christian. Okay, one of the points I try to make in the book, I think a very important psalm in the Bible is the second psalm. It says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Mm -hmm. Or we'd say in our, in our vernacular, why is the world in an uproar? And why do the people have a vain imagination? That's yes. two different questions. Yes. Okay, then he says... Because the kings of the earth and their rulers have taken counsel together against the Lord and his Christ. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, it has to do, not, not just with the political leaders, that's, a, that's an expression that means 
the ruling elite, the opinion shapers, the educators, the entertainers, the molders, have all got this amazing consensus, which is, turns out to be anti-Christian. Okay, mm -hmm. And there is no better way to strip a former Judeo-Christian land of any last traces of Christianity to count for anything right. than to bring in massive immigration of people that are actually hostile to it. That's so interesting. So the thing is, is that we have imagined a vain thing. We've, yes, we, we have. have fallen to relativism, political yes. correctness, uh, probably postmodern thought. And multiculturalism. Multiculturalism. And, you know, so I, I remember I was going to ask you the next question, you know, has the church been bullied to keep silent? But I think we've been bullied by our own culture. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. As, yeah. A, and as well as uh, having a fear that we're committing some kind of hate speech uh, exactly. with, within the political realm. And so it seems like the enemy has really come against our culture to keep quiet, to keep silent. And so exactly. you, you see the church, as you said in your book, The Sleeping Church in a Foolish World. Well, guess what? The church has fallen for this foolish world, I believe. And so that's, that's right. right? I mean, we, haven't even, we haven't had to be bullied. Right. Because people already have the same consensus in many churches as the world does, which is right. basically anti Judeo Christian, anti Western. Yeah. It's a knee jerk reaction. If it's from the West, it's from the Christian West, then it's gotta be bad. I mean, if you think about your own education in these public schools, mm -hmm. um, the only fact of history is slavery or something like that. You know, I mean it's just everything that we do has been criticized. Yes. Uh, well, deliberately by the way. There are there are thinkers that had had come over here the the uh, mm -hmm. the Frankfurt School of, of Philosophy yes. came over here, and they have actually strategized how to tear us down yes. and demoralize us. Well, we're demoralized. Okay, now now I won't say the church is totally silent. There are some very powerful voices speaking out, but for the most part, yes. And, and by the way, if you want to take a look at um, where where the future holds, look at Sweden. Yes, exactly. Sweden is a nightmare, okay? Sweden is a nation that was a very comfortable, very high standard of living, very civil society, a low crime, almost virtually nothing. And it's basically run by um, liberal Christians, uh, feminists, and uh, it's a coalition of, of everything the left is, okay? Sweden is, is in on steroids. Yes. And the bishop of, of the state church of Sweden is a lesbian woman who conceived a child out of wedlock and who said, tear down the crosses in our churches because we don't want to offend our new oh guests, the Muslims. Yeah. And they have brought them in in the hundreds of thousands. Oh wow. Another place, Germany. I mean, I don't need to tell your listeners. I mean, we can see it with our eyes if anyone has eyes to see. The, the Europe that we once knew is gone. Yes, it is. Okay. The, the, the dreams of, of all the Muslim hordes down through the centuries are being realized, not with uh, mm -hmm. fighting, but with just immigration. Yeah. And, you know, you, you had mentioned about the liberal progressives. You know, uh, we've talked about that so many times on our show, the, the religion of liberalism and where it's gotten it us and everything. It is a religion. And, you know, we've fallen prey to it. The church has fallen prey to it. And that is why we are living in the age of apostasy, uh, we, yes, which we have covered on our show again and again. And that's why people are falling away from the faith because of the false gospels, because of the oh, lukewarmness, uh, because of, like you said before, uh, the vain, oh, the, the the vain thing, you know that we yeah, have, we've imagined the, the vain imagination. Oh yeah, that we've allowed. Good. Yep, and I know that we both would agree that we need to seek out the truth of the gospel, Pastor Bill. This last hour, along with eschatology, and you oh, know, exactly. and that's why you know I, I'm thinking that this is something that needs to be taught right now because, like you said, it seems like the church is sleeping. It has to wake up. Our eyes have to be open to the truth, and you shared so much truth already about oh, yeah. Islam. But why don't we talk about eschatology? Can you give us yeah. the meaning of that and why it is important to teach it, especially today? Yes, eschatology means the study of the end things, mm -hmm. of the end, okay? 
and it has to do with prof- the prophecies about the end times, the last days, it has to do with death, heaven, hell. These are subjects notoriously avoided. There is a major deceiver, uh, Rick Warren, who's a very popular yes. Christian author, but he's a deceiver who wrote in one of his books, don't worry about the end times. What will happen will happen. You just go about doing God's work. Mm. He couldn't have been further from the truth. You know, Jesus and the apostles said, be awake, be alert, be watching the prophecies. And that's that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book, too, is that uh, it should be a tremendous encouragement for people. I show how there are certain prophecies that are thousands of years old that are being acted out right on the world stage in, in what I call high-definition color. I mean, yes. it's, it's unbelievable what's happening, and uh, but people are oblivious to it. Now, I wrote uh, another book that, which has to do with this apostasy called The Where the New Prophets. This, this is a problem, too. Uh, this, uh, this has been going on, especially among Pentecostal and charismatic groups, but it's spread over into evangelicalism, this idea of new prophets. So I'm talking to one of my son's friends, and he says, you're writing a book? I said, yeah, what it's about? I said, prophecy. He said, oh, yeah, we have people who come to our church and give everyone a word. And he had no mm. concept mm-hmm. of what the Bible prophecies are because they've been eating this straw, okay? yes. this, this, this garbage. It's his man-centered Rick Joyner. The, these other deceivers have been pumping people full yes. of personal words. And, they, and what they've done is successfully supplanted the old interest in scouring the prophets to see, the, the real prophets, to see what was going to happen. Therefore, we're, people are are oblivious. Yes, you're right to the stuff that's happening. It's yes. unreal. Yeah, and, and you know what, Pastor? I, you know, I was thinking. I say this so many times. I know we didn't have a conversation on this, but you know, the the enemy has stolen every single word that you can think of. Of, for example, what is being born again? You know, right. what about the gifts of the Spirit? He's distorted right. that. What about the kingdom of God? That's been distorted. Distorted. You yeah, know, everything exactly. that we, that that is important. I mean. The whole Bible is important, but but the key words, you know, being born oh, yeah. again, being baptized in the Spirit, you know, in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That's been what stolen. What does that mean? Yeah, and even basic things like prayer. Yes, I, I, I exactly. Heard on N- yes, NPR, National yeah. Public Radio. They're they're atheists, right? And they had a lady that said, "I'm going to cover this church that has discovered a new powerful spiritual warfare." And she said, now, I don't believe in God. I was raised in a Jewish home, and we were atheists. I don't even believe in God, but Mm -hmm. I want to see this. And she went out to Colorado to this church with this celebrated pastor, and she interviewed people, and she said, what is prayer to you? And one guy goes, well, prayer is just blasting a hole through the heavenlies and taking authority over the strong man. And another guy said, prayer is bringing heaven down to earth and getting into the presence. And this is really strange. She goes, uh, as an aside, you know how they do on NPR. She goes, "That's funny. I thought prayer was just asking God or talking to God." Here it is an atheistic reporter yes, that now that has a better grasp of prayer than these people in this spiritual warfare church. Yes, it's it's crazy it's what crazy. they've done yes. and what the Toronto blessing did to the church, what the false prophets have done to the church, and 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 we're at a time now where we really needed to be sober, alert, and awake. And we're not ready, and neither is our culture. They're not ready for Islam because they've embraced uh, multiculturalism. We're going on a break. We'll be back with Bill Randalls to talk about God's controversy with the Islamic Arab world. So please stay tuned. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back. So please stay tuned. Many would agree that we are living in unprecedented times. Grave immorality is on the rise as in the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. There are wars and rumors of wars as nations rise against nations. Prophecy is being fulfilled as the birth pangs become quicker and harder. These are the signs of the return of Jesus Christ. There is one sign often left untaught. Jesus also told the disciples in the Olivet Discourse to take heed that no man deceive you. This warning applies to us too. Deception has infiltrated the churches through many false teachings and movements, making apostasy paramount. As contenders of the faith, we do our best to research and discuss these false teachings for you, the listener. Thank you for having a love for the truth. 
Welcome back. With us is Bill Randalls. Bill penned the book, A Sword in the Land, the Muslim World and Bible Prophecy, which continues to be our discussion in this segment as well. You know, Bill, um, you said before that our culture or, or the Western culture is sick with multiculturalism, yeah. and we talked about the progressive liberal thought, political correctness, and all of that. We have become a very, very weak church, and therefore, according to your book, you said th that the church has been sleeping. And uh, this, I just pray that the, the, the church wakes up, because really, the root cause— of God's controversy with the Islamic Arab world, as I read in your book, that the, yeah. the Bible has much to say about the Arab people. The prophets oh, yeah. of old foretold in great detail the origin and the destiny of the Arab people. In yeah. chapter 2 of your book, we read about the sons of Abraham, Ishmael, yeah. and Esau, and how they play a, a prominent role in the last day scenario. And I do want to, uh, let's, let's reiterate the roles that Ishmael and sure. Isaac play in reference to their father Abraham and God uh, and, and let's attach that uh, the, the story and the spiritual meaning together sure. so I'd that, love to yeah okay great I would absolutely love to okay. first of all I want to say that it's not even always necessarily a negative role Esau and Ishmael are very, very important just by virtue of the fact that they are children of Abraham mm -hmm. furthermore um, Ishmael has this distinction. He's one of only about five people in the Bible who was named by an angel before he was born, okay? Um, that, that one of those that, uh, that shares that distinction is John the Baptist, another is Jesus, okay? Mm. But Ishmael was named by an angel before he was born. He's very important. God told Abram that he would make him great, and he is. Uh, the Arab world is great. It's truly great. Mm -hmm. It's great in number, great in influence, great in size. Uh, and, and there are many great things about it, okay? But the, the other thing is that um, um, Genesis is a book, uh, one of the threads that runs through Genesis, I've been going through Genesis lately, one of the threads that runs through Genesis is election, okay? Because God said he's going to bring a chosen person into the world, right, right, right from Genesis 3, mm -hmm. and he is going to use this person to crush the serpent's head, and bruises heel. Now you and I know who that person is. Yes. That's the Messiah, Jesus Christ, yes. right? But then Genesis develops, okay? All the nations of the world defect from God in Genesis 10, the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. Yes. So what do we find next? Genesis 12. God goes to a person who doesn't even believe in him. He's a moon worshiper. He's an idolater. He lives in what we call Iraq today, Name Abram, and he says, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to choose you to bring somebody through the world, he's talking about the same person, the Messiah, yes. to bless every family on the face of the earth. You're gonna, your seed are going to be as the sand of the sea and the star of the sky. Okay, the problem is this man's in his 80s and he's barren, and his wife's barren. Okay, now, now this is one of the things I've been telling people everywhere I go. When If you and I were going to start a new nation, because all the nations defected, we would find a 20-year-old couple and say, be fruitful, multiply. That's right. When God wants to start a new nation, he finds a barren old moon worshiper with a barren old woman, and they're long past childbearing age, and he says, now there's a couple I can use, okay? <laughs> and they did. They had a son yes. that by a miracle. When Abram was 100 years old, they had Ishmael, or Isaac. Yes. Okay. But the problem is, is that and that's the one God chose. The problem is they had already had a son, Ishmael, by natural means. Mm -hmm. And Abram wanted the chosen one to be Ishmael. But God chose Isaac. Yes. Not for salvation, but to bring the Savior into the world. Yes. Okay. Then in the next generation, Isaac has twins. He loves the oldest one, Esau. He loves him because he's a virile outdoorsman. He could go out and get venison, and Isaac loved his food. And this boy was just everything this man loved. And his second son, not so much, Jacob. Isaac chose Esau, and he's, he's preparing to, to put the Abrahamic blessing on Esau, a man mm -hmm. so profane yes. that he married two pagan women at once. His mother said, I'd like to die. Okay. But he's getting ready to pro pro proclaim him as the one. 
And you know the story how Jacob went in, uh, Re- yes. Rebecca and Jacob went in, and he got the blessing. Now, now here's the funny thing, okay? Everybody condemns Jacob for stealing the blessing, except God. Mm-hmm. God doesn't say a word about that. Yes. There's nothing wrong with what Jacob did. Why? Right. Jacob was chosen yes. to be the one, okay? Yeah, Isaac chose Esau, God chose Jacob. And the Bible says in the book of Ro- uh, Hebrews that by faith, um, by faith, Isaac blessed his children. Mm-hmm. It's Hebrews 11. By faith, Isaac blessed his children. Well, it doesn't look like faith because Isaac thinks he's blessing one and not the other. Yes. So how could it be by faith? Yes, well, when, when you read the account, here's where the faith comes in. Esau comes in after Jacob got the blessing, and he, and he finds out, what? <laughs> and Isaac says to him, I have already blessed your brother, and he shall be blessed. Yes. Okay, in other words, he didn't say, oops, that was a mistake. I'll take that back, and I'll give it to you. Right, yes. He realized that that was God, that God had Mm. chosen Jacob, not Esau. Now, you flash forward to the whole world, okay? The whole world Mm -hmm. is being forced into making a choice between Jacob and Esau. Europe, obviously, in the last hundred years has proven that for the most part they want nothing to do with Jacob. They made it miserable for the Jews. They threw the Jews out. The Jews had to leave. Guess what? They get Esau. Lots of Esau. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. This, this struggle, this, this woman's pregnant. Rebecca's pregnant. Yes. And she's got a troubled pregnancy. She takes it to God, and he gives a prophecy of these two. He says, two children are born in your womb. Yes. Okay. The one will be stronger than the other. The elder will serve the younger. All right. He gives a prophecy to them. Um, and um, because they're so both so important. Now, people think, well, that's Bible history, but, you know, the, the, another name for Esau is Edom. And there was a nation of Edom in southern Jordan that was prominent, but it was eventually subdued by King David, okay? But Edom is in the last day's prophecies, hmm. okay? So how could Edom be in the last day's prophecies if, if King David just crushed them? There has to be an entity called Edom, in other words, a close relative of the Jews, and the way you can identify them, there's uh, a prophecy of Obadiah and the prophecy of Ezekiel 35, both basically say the same thing. God is going to judge Edom because Edom is uh, claiming possession of Jacob's inheritance, and Edom hates Jacob and loves Mm -hmm. blood and chases Jacob down and kills Jacob with impunity, Mm -hmm. and God is going to judge him. Okay, now I, I saw... The cover of Time magazine one day that was stunning. And what it was was Arabs um, celebrating in the street. Two of them are standing at the window of the balcony, and they're raising their hands. And their hands are just dripping with blood. And they're throwing uh, candies and sweets out to the celebrating crowds below. What had happened? Well, two Russian Jews took a wrong turn in Ramallah and got torn to shreds. Oh, my goodness. That's horrible. By uh, Arabs. Okay. Edom, the, the, the Edom has a place in Bible prophecy. I talk about it a lot in my book. Ezekiel mm-hmm. thirty-five yes. is a great place for anyone to start. And, and he says, "Look, since you love blood so much, mm-hmm. then I'm going to pursue you with blood." Mm-hmm. Okay. And then the next chapter of Ezekiel says Ezekiel thirty-six, and that is about uh, the mountains of Israel, the prophecy of the mountains of Israel. But see, we get mixed up on these names. The modern name for the mountains of Israel, according to secularism, is the West Bank. Yes. Okay. The occupied territories, the heart of biblical Israel, is claimed by the UN to be to be a possession of the sons of Edom. All right. Now he goes on to say that uh, um, Jesus said in the definitive chapter on the end times. Remember, he said, here's what it's going to be like in the end times. It'll be earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars. And everything he says is universal. Okay, earthquakes Mm -hmm. everywhere, wars everywhere. All of a sudden, it gets local in verse 15. He says, then let them which be in Judea Mm -hmm. flee to the mountains. Okay. See, what happens, because you asked me about the controversy. See, here's one, there's a twofold controversy. A major controversy the world has with Israel is that they allow people that are Jews to live in what the Bible calls Judea. They call the West Bank. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's a controversy. That's, that's not just with Jews, that's with God. 
Okay, because God said in Ezekiel 36 to the mountains of Israel, don't listen to the talkers. I know they're talking about you, and I know they're giving your holy places over to the Gentiles. But by the way, that, that is stunningly relevant because I don't know if you follow this or not, but the UN has a group called UNESCO. Have you ever heard yes, of it? Yes, I have. Absolutely. United Nations Educational, Social, and Cultural Organization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. UNESCO has just decreed that the tomb of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, and Leah is a Muslim shrine. Oh, gosh. Okay. I didn't know that. And then they decreed, uh, now those are the patriarchs, and I don't know what call me old-fashioned, but when I hear Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I think the Jews. But UNESCO said, no, that's a Muslim shrine. Yeah, and one of the patriarch's wives is missing, Rachel, because she died outside of Bethlehem. So there's a tomb outside of Bethlehem, the tomb of Rachel. Mm-hmm. Well, they didn't want to leave her out, so UNESCO just decreed that the tomb of Rachel is a Muslim shrine. Okay, mm-hmm. now that now UNESCO's latest uh, agreement is that the Temple Mount is a Muslim shrine. Yes, yeah. And the city of Jerusalem is actually belongs mm-hmm. to Muslims. Mm-hmm. Now, look, what, what we're seeing is a controversy that is going to embroil the whole world yes. in all of the events yeah. of the end times. It's just amazing it's to me. Okay? It is stunning. But that's right out of Ezekiel 36, where mm-hmm. God said to the land of Judea, don't worry, okay, because I hear them talking about you and apportioning your holy places to the others that rejoice over you, yeah, but I'm not going to let that happen. Okay, Mm -hmm. so we've got a huge controversy coming. And you know what, Bill, this is what I was thinking, too, is, you know, there's a spiritual meaning uh, to these stories as well. As you, well, let, let me just back up. If I was yeah. Ishmael, you know, I would yeah. say, hey, gee, that's not fair, you know? Right, uh, right, sure you would. You know, but see, what we're looking at is that Ishmael was of the flesh. You know, he was of yeah. the flesh, not the spirit. And that's right. You agree with that, that right? That, that, and well, yeah, he, in fact, he's called profane. Yes, okay. exactly. So, but, but I would I would like to add something to that, though, okay. that I think it's really important, mm-hmm. Sandy, okay, is that... Look, there was even a way for Ishmael, okay? Uh, there was a way for him to be saved. And as a matter of fact, many of his descendants were saved. If you remember, the, the Middle East was almost entirely Christian before the Muslim incursion, okay? Mm-hmm. What, what, there's a second prophecy where Ishmael says, or Esau says to his father, excuse me, I'm talking about Esau, isn't there a blessing for me? And the father says, well, yes, you, uh, and he proclaims by the Spirit, you will live away from the dew of the heaven and the rain of the earth. You will live by your sword. That's not like a blessing. And you will serve your brother. Okay. The way out is for him to humble himself to the religion his brother revealed. Instead, they, they're drawn to this, this new religion, Islam, which is a rival. We're going on a break. We will be right back with Pastor Bill Randalls. So please stay tuned for the last session. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we read that men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, without self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. They will be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Thank you for having a love for the truth. Welcome back. We are in our last segment with Pastor Bill Randalls, and we're going to get right into this because we still have a lot to cover. You know, Pastor, in Chapter 15 of your book, we read that there is a growing controversy between the leaders of the world and the God of the Bible over a particular piece of real estate, which is Israel uh, or, or Jerusalem. Can you, can you brief us on this? Yeah, I'd love to. You no. know, it, there's, there's this incredibly intense description of the very last events of the end times in Isaiah 34, in which he says that the controversy is called the controversy of Zion, okay? Now look, the center of the world is Israel. The center of Israel is Jerusalem. 
and the center of Jerusalem is the Temple Mount. Okay, <clears throat> the whole world, the UN, which is amazing, something that began around the same time that the, the nation of Israel was revived. Okay, the UN began in 1945. The nation of Israel came into being in 1948 again after 2,000 years. Yes. Okay, the UN, which is the the, the governing the the Congress of every single nation on earth, spends about a third of its time discussing Israel and Judea, or the West Bank, they call it, and Jerusalem, the boundaries, the borders, the people, the, uh, there are so many condemnations of these places. They are, uh, when you look at the size of Israel, uh, in comparison to the rest of the Arab world, let alone the rest of the world, it's just staggering to think that the world governing body would spend so much time uh, deliberating over this. Yes. But this is exactly what God said would happen. The kings of the earth take counsel together against the Lord and his Christ. Let me give you a few examples. Okay, Jerusalem is the only city on earth that the United Nations has cut in half. Okay, they have mm -hmm. divided it. They have an East Jerusalem and a West Jerusalem. They want to give the East Jerusalem to the Palestinians and the West Jerusalem they might grant to the Jews. Okay, this is, uh, this is, unprecedented. There's no other city like it. Mm -hmm. Every single president since Eisenhower saving Obama the last time has vowed to move our U.S. embassy to Jerusalem. Not a one of them have done that. Mm -hmm. Trump is saying he'll do it. I'd be amazed if he did it, yes. okay, because of the conflagration that that will smart off. I don't know if you remember this last year, but there was a story about a 14-year-old Jewish boy, a United States citizen, who applied for a passport. And they said at the passport office, uh, what's your origin? He said, I'm from Jerusalem, Israel. And they said, you can't do that. Yeah. Jerusalem's not in Israel. He did what any red-blooded American boy would do. He sued, okay? And the lower court ruled against him. You cannot say Jerusalem's in Israel. Really? He, wow. he took it to a higher court, yes. He took it to a higher court, and they said, you cannot say Jerusalem's in Israel. Now listen, said that he takes it to the Supreme Court. Wow. Now, now think about it with me. The Supreme Court gets so many cases. Yes. They can only pick out the ones they think are the most significant. And they wanted to rule on this one. Wow. Okay. I mean, just ask yourself, why? Mm -hmm. What would be the point? Mm -hmm. But they ruled. You cannot say Jerusalem is part of Israel. It's not. Okay. Now God says it is. And Benjamin Netanyahu says it's their capital indivisible. But the rest of the world insists it's not part of Israel. It's an international city. It's a divided city. It belongs to the Muslims. I mean, this is going to be a controversy because, as you know, Jerusalem is, biblically speaking, the most important city. Yes, on it earth. is. Yeah. And if for no other reason, just ponder this. The only city on earth that God said, I put my exactly. name there forever. Yes. Okay, whatever that means, you've got to admit, that's huge. That is huge. We <laughs> often sing this song, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised as a city of our God in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Yes. That's the city where the king's coming back. That's the city where the king was crucified. That's the city where Satan was dealt his most greatest blow. But Jerusalem is also claimed by the Muslims as the third holiest site. Hmm. Okay. Now, Jerusalem is in the Bible, obviously. Okay. It's never mentioned by name once in the Quran. Okay. The Quran does not mention Jerusalem by name. That's interesting. But there is one verse that modern Muslim scholars say is talking about Jerusalem, and that is a verse called the Isra, in which Muhammad gets on a a winged horse and flies out to Al-Aqsa. Have you ever heard that expression? Al-Aqsa. The farthest places. Mm -hmm. There's an Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade. There's an Al-Aqsa Mosque, okay? And they say Al-Aqsa is Jerusalem. And there he ascended to heaven and prayed with Moses and Jesus because they're all Muslim. Okay, that's the Isra in, hmm. the, in the Quran. That is the only verse in the Quran, and it doesn't even mention the city. But it's that single inference that they say gives them the preeminent claim to the city of Jerusalem is their third holiest site. And that's being respected, you know, by the leaders of the world. That's interesting. It's crazy. In that fact, crazy. One, one of the things a lot of people don't remember is that when Obama became president, 
within the first year, he did something absolutely unprecedented. He went to Cairo, Egypt, Al-Azhar University, and gave a speech to the Muslim world. I remember that. I mean, mm -hmm. one, out of, one out of seven people in the world is Muslim, and our president addressed all of them. Now, I could go into the speech and its lies, but that's a good topic for another time. Yeah. But he did make one reference from the Koran, Cindy. Mm -hmm. he, did, he gave only one, but it was the Isra. Wow. I'll wrap your mind around it. The world leader of the free world just cited the one verse in this dubious holy book that gives them the claim to the city of Jerusalem. Jer uh, Zechariah 12 says, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone, mm -hmm. a cup of trembling to yes. all the nations round about. Anyone who picks up that stone will be lacerated. He's going to make Jerusalem the controversy yes. of the whole world, okay? And uh, that's, that's one example of it, okay? So you got, you got UNESCO saying the Temple Mount does not belong to the Jews. You got John Kerry standing up and forbidding Jews to pray on the Temple Mount. I mean, it's just like it's a nightmare. Just, it is a nightmare. But it it's a nightmare. nightmare that was predicted, and it's a nightmare yes. that's playing out the scenario, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you got the West Bank. We talked about that. The West Bank is actually Judea, okay? Our Lord sprang from Judea. They're saying it's the Palestinian state. Joel had a vision in which all nations, he said, this will happen in the time when I return to captivity to Jerusalem and Judea, Israel and Judea, okay? In other words, post-1948, he said, I'll bring all nations down to the Valley of Joshua because they parted my land. That's, yeah, okay. yeah we're seeing and they And they cast lots for my people. That's another way of saying they voted for or against. It's a reference to the U.N. All right, this is, we are seeing prophecies come to pass right before our eyes. Now, now the Palestinians, okay, did you know the Palestinian, Palestinian is a fraud name? Okay, there are I, no Palestinians. Yeah, I heard that. I heard that. I'd like to know where it came from. Well, that's a great, great question. Mm -hmm. See, when, when the Romans wanted to totally crush, humiliate, and wipe out the Jewish nation once and for all, it, they, they raised the temple completely, destroyed it, as Jesus predicted they would, and then they uh, gave a new name to the province to humiliate them. It's called Syria Provincia Palestina, which is uh, mm -hmm. Latin for the province of the Philistines. Okay, so in other words, to humiliate the Jews, they called the province Palestina uh, as a humiliation to squash them uh, uh, by naming the land for the name of their inveterate ancient enemy. Okay, mm -hmm. there is no Palestinian uh, culture that survives. There are no Philistines surviving. The, what, what the people that call themselves Palestinian have only started calling themselves that since 1964. I heard okay? about that, yes. yes. And, 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 and before that, I mean, you can look at your Bible maps, and many Bibles have Palestine as, a, as the name for the Holy Land. And that's a fraud. It's not true. And, uh, and the names of these places are very important for understanding, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why I wrote my book. So Palestinians are a fraud. What these people are is, is Arabs. They're Edomites. And uh, they have rights. And they have more rights in Israel than they have in the rest of the Muslim world. It's, it's unreal. There are many of them are very loyal Israeli citizens and mm -hmm. soldiers. There are many Pal so-called Palestinians on the Knesset. But there is this Palestinian intifada, this uprising, yes. and, uh, and it's going to bring the whole world in, of course. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and it, it truly is a place of a, of a cup of trembling. We're seeing that right now as prophesied, and that's why it's very oh, yes. important that we believe in prophecies. And, oh, definitely. Uh, definitely, because it's, it's the Lord telling us to be aware, giving us a warning as what is to come and what is the sign of His coming. And exactly. one, of, one of the signs of His coming uh, are these prophecies that are being fulfilled. That's why we have to be ready and yes. get as close to the Lord as we can, you know, and desire Him and make Him our first love, and that's what we need to do. So uh, getting back to what we were talking about, I, I, I want to know, like I've always felt or thought that the Philistines were in some way in relationship with, I thought the Palestinians, but I think I'm wrong. Who are the Philistines? Well, the Philistines were Phoenicians yes. that had invaded the, the uh, west coast of Israel and mm -hmm. set up five cities, and they were a thorn in their side until 
until uh, the times of King David, okay, mm -hmm. and, and he finally put them down. Yes. But uh, they, uh, so therefore, you, you still have Gaza to this day, you have uh, Ashdod to this day. These are the ancient Philistine cities, but they have no connection whatsoever with um, Palestinians? the Arab people. I okay. mean, that's just, they just, they, what they did is they, they adapted that name. I mean, back in World War II, the British Army had a Palestinian regiment of soldiers. It was all Jews. There was a Palestinian symphony in Jerusalem, all Jews. There was a Palestinian Times newspaper, which became the Jerusalem Post, all Jewish, okay? All of a sudden, in 1964, Yasser Arafat starts the Palest uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization, and out of the blue, you've got this new culture that never existed before, but they say is ancient. So this <laughs> this is how through deception. I mean, they, they are engulfing the world in, mm -hmm. into this conflict. Mm -hmm. well, you got to have a victim. It seems like the prince in power of this world, who is Satan, uh, yeah. has done, I, I hate to say it, he's done a great job in deception and deceiving people. But we as followers of Jesus Christ really need to open our eyes and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the truth. And, exactly. uh, and that's what we need to do and let the Holy Spirit, allow the Holy Spirit in our lives to lead us to all truth and understanding. And that's, Amen. that's what we're talking about here. You know, well, uh, you know, yeah, go ahead, Pastor. What did I'd you like to input something, too, is that Absolutely. you're talking about, you know, how we need to know these prophecies. They're, they're just incredible, right? Yes, they are. I remember in 1967 when um, Moshe Dayan led the Israeli Defense Forces in and took Jerusalem after many, many centuries. And you can remember those heart-rendering pictures of Jewish paratroopers weeping at the Wailing Wall, okay? Mm -hmm. And that moved the whole world in the Six-Day War. But then he turned it back to the Jordanian Waqf, which is a, a Muslim custody ship, which to this day the Temple Mount is under the custodianship of the Jordanian Waqf. I often wondered myself, why did he do that? And then I read the words of Jesus. Jerusalem shall be trodden underfoot until the time of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. Mm. See, see, the thing about prophecy is all you have to do these days to, to evangelize powerfully is point out to people. You see that that's happening there? That's right out of the Bible. Yes. There's a lot of se secular people yeah. who know that there's something terribly Absolutely. wrong. Absolutely, yes. Very much like those guests at that feast that saw the handwriting on the wall. Uh -huh. The problem is they don't know the interpretation. Yes. But I believe that the least church, a Christian in any church that teaches any amount of Bible prophecy has more insight into what's going on in the world than all the experts at the UN put together. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Our job is to be like Daniel, to interpret the handwriting on the wall. And I've never seen a better time. I've never seen a better time to do this. I was saved in 78 around the same time you were. And I have never seen such a time where you can look out see what's happening and say that's in the Bible. Maranatha. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back, so please stay tuned. Welcome back. I'm Cindy Hartline, your host for Love for the Truth Radio Philadelphia. Look us up on lovefortheTruthRadio.com. We air programs via stream every day. You can find program archives uh, with contributors John Haller, Chris Quintana, Carl Tycrib, Patrick Wood, guests like Bill Koenig, Ray Youngin, Johanna Michelson, Bill Salas, and Jan Markell, and many more veterans of the faith with the voice of truth. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and on Rapture Ready Radio on Monday evenings on Blog Talk Radio with Jackie Elnor, along with numerous web radio programs who air us on their stations worldwide. We're back with Pastor Bill Randalls. Again, you need to get a hold of his book, A Sword on the Land, The Muslim World and Bible Prophecy. Bill, you gave us so much information. I mean, almost too much. that We can't even really wrap our brains around this. But you know what? We are living in unprecedented times. We are seeing prophecy being fulfilled just as the Bible said. And, and Pastor, you have so much information in this book. Uh, do you have any last-minute advice that you can offer our listeners as a pastor? Well, look, uh, yeah, my last-minute advice is, look, stay live close to God. I believe Jesus is coming very quickly. Understand enough prophecy to be able to show people what's going on, because there's a lot of people open now. They're afraid they just don't know what of. 
don't be ashamed to share Christ. I think everything's wrapping up very rapidly, mm -hmm. and we must be on our toes. And uh, I just pray you'll stay in fellowship, too, with other Christians. Yeah, amen. We need that. And how can they get your book? So. Okay, my book is on Amazon, mm -hmm. and it's on Kindle, or you can get it at believersingrace.com, which is our church. And I put um, my all my books are there, and all my books are on Amazon. And uh, also I blog at billrandalls.wordpress.com. So any one of those, there's a website called a sword on the land dot com. Any one of those places you can get it. Mm -hmm. And I really hope you do and enjoy it. Yeah, and we'll put that information up on the video as well. So that will be right there for people to, to write down and to, to see. So, uh, Bill, thank you so much for all of your information. Amazing, amazing prophecies being fulfilled right before our eyes. Thank you for being a faithful servant of the Lord in all of your study, in all of your research. Again, get a sword on the land, people, the Muslim world and prophecy, and you will understand what is taking place today. Thanks, Bill. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cindy. It's been a blessing on the show.